All right, if you are in grade 5 to 7 or in grade 8 to 12, you guys can have your classes right now, and the rest of us can listen to David Beza. Matt, I was actually preparing to, I know I'm way louder than Matt. Um, sorry, I, if I, if, what happened, Patrick? Are you just saying hi? <laughs> Hello, Patrick. <laughs> um, uh, I was sitting there preparing to build on what you were just saying, Matt, about um, the fundraising and the financial support, and I was going to fill in that we had had an email exchange early in the week, but you put that together with the text that we had this morning, and you did a perfect things that I am sad for you about is that you're not often in our Sunday morning prayer time. And, but here's the good news. You're invited. Uh, even when the doors are closed, uh, if you see like the little front room there, you'll see people praying. Even if the doors are closed, even if you come in a little later, don't worry about it. You are not interrupting. And I'm sad for you because it is a time that blesses me every Sunday. It also really messes with my head because it gives me new thoughts and things that I get excited about. And I feel like, oh, I need to now weave that into the message. And so I think some of you saw it today. I was scrolling some notes, some other, other notes into what I already have for notes. Um, but I want to extend that or re-extend that inv invitation that you are invited to our prayer every, every Sunday morning. We generally start around 9.30. Um, Carolee usually has to remind us that we're here to pray, not just to talk about prayer. And uh, But it's it's really, it's a beautiful time. And today, one of the things we, we prayed about was summer camps. And, you know, I just, as we were praying, I just got excited all over again, with reinvigorated with this vision for what happens in the lives of these kids. And it's not every kid, it's not every year. But it is so consistent. There is a, this incubator for transformation in these kids in this week, whether it be the kids' camp or the youth camp. And it is an opportunity not just to have a good time, and it's a lot of fun. You don't get a lot of sleep, uh, and you eat a lot of candy. Um, but it's, it's, it's not just about that. There is an opportunity for change. And this change, what we see is this change doesn't just affect the kid. And, and it's interesting, the timing is strategic. It's right before they go back to school, right? And, and that's a beautiful thing, but it's not just that. They come back to families, and families get changed because of what happens at camp. And it's not just that. Neighborhoods get changed. And, and it can be even bigger than that. Sometimes God gets hold of the life of a kid, and, and they get put on a path to change nations, and, and I don't want to oversell this, <laughs> but at the same time, this is something, uh, like I, Matt said it perfectly, we believe in this. So I wanted to say that. That's just something that I, really I got inspired about when we were praying. Um, one more thing I want to report is that this week, uh, or this weekend, yesterday, was it yesterday? It feels like a month ago already. No, two days ago, Friday night, we were at um, the Amparo, uh, just a, an appreciation night where we got a very thorough report from uh, Brent, Michelle, and their, their team. For those of you who aren't aware of what Amparo is, Amparo is the ministry in Nicaragua, where uh, Brent, Michelle have gone to Nicaragua, and um, they've been very involved. Their ministry has taken a lot of different forms, but has really come to a, a point where they have recently launched a school. Brent's a a builder. He's a he's a project. He's a, a what is it, what would you call him? A planner. He's a he's a builder, uh, very much a, a developer. That's the word. He's a developer. He's he, he and Michelle have built a school, which is really a weird thing for a developer to do. Um, but they have brought in uh, nice complimentary pieces. I got to meet uh, Steve Paris, who was formerly of White Rock Christian Academy, a brilliant educator who is really intimately walking with them. Uh, in this project. And I, I know I've got a message to preach, but I can't not share with you uh, some of my excitement. Um, and I, I'm hoping to have Brett Michelle or somebody come and represent Amparo to come and share maybe even the same video we got to see. But the picture that got painted is you've got this very, very remote area. Nicaragua is, is one of the poorest. Uh, they, they've described it as the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So very, very... Uh, 
like riddled with poverty. Like it's 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 a poor country. And even in the capital or or bigger cities like Managua, there. Um, in fact, that's where their ministry started, where Michelle would go into the dump where people were foraging for whatever they could find, and she would minister to the people in the dump. But that was the big city. Somehow they got connected to this village. Well, actually, I know the story, but they got connected to this village. Uh, I believe it's an eight-hour trek away into the wilderness, and it's called Mango. And there they felt called to eventually build this school. Well, this is a, a private school an independent school with all of the, the, the like, like specialnesses of, of an attention and care and high quality that you'd find there, but it's for free, free to these students, obviously through sponsorship. And the, the cost of sponsoring these kids is really low when you consider everything they get. Well, as you can imagine, this has affected the area. They are coming in throngs. Is that the right word? They're coming. They're coming. A lot of people are coming. And they are as full as they can be today. And all morning long, they serve the primary kids. All afternoon long, they serve the secondary kids. And then on Saturdays, uh, so that's, uh, I think, 165 kids all together. Is that right, Tony? 165 kids all together throughout the day. And then on Saturdays, they have 120 adults come every Saturday. And the stories of these these kids traveling, um, they've started a, 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 a boat service four hours upriver. They start collecting kids and bringing them down to the village. But there's stories of, of people coming from as far as eight hours away to be educated at this school. One cute story of a three and four year old coming on horseback by themselves every day, uh, one or two hours each way, just to be a part of what they're doing in Mango. And what they're do I got, I'm, this is too much information, but one of their first projects is they're teaching them how to build chicken coops. They're teaching them how to build one for the egg layers and one for the meat makers, which, sorry for you vegetarians, but, uh, uh, and, and they're teaching them how to do this, and, and, and it, this is going to now feed them at the school. They're going to have meat. They're going to have eggs. The next project is to, to teach them how to garden, and they're going to have fresh fruits and vegetables. It is, it is transforming this area, but not only that. And this is the connection I want to I bring back to summer camps. It's not just changing them in that space. Now they all go out to their homes, some of them eight hours away, some of them four hours upriver, and they take what they've learned, and they're building their chicken coops in their homes. Well, maybe not in their homes. They're building them in, on their properties for their villages. And they're learning how to plant and care for gardens to, to feed. Their, it is exploding the blessing in that area. And there's a parallel between what we want to do at summer camps and, and what is being done in Nicaragua. It's not just the moment that we're celebrating. It's that seed potential for what's going to come of it. And uh, I just, I, I had to share my excitement um, because I am very excited for what they're doing in Amparo, uh, in Nicaragua with Amparo, and uh, I'm excited to, to share more with you in the weeks to come. But the next three weeks, let's get into the message we'll, where you can see the big mouth here. Alex Connor is so creative. She's come up with our whole uh, sermon series, slides, uh, backgrounds and stuff. And this series is going to be called, it's just short, three weeks, and it's called, We Need to Talk About It. And we're going to be talking about sin. And we're talking specifically, we're going to come at three different types of sin. Uh, sin related to pride, sin related to money, and sin related to sex. So you can plan your attendance accordingly. It's too late. You're here for pride. Uh, I, I debated, do we talk about sex on Father's Day? Or, no, we're going to talk about money on Father's Day, and we're going to talk about sex on Sex Day. And so that's the next three weeks, all right? Uh, and the aim of these Sundays is to bring us to a point of repentance. It is to, to usher in an opportunity and, and, a, and an intimate spot where we can repent. And uh, that could scare some of you right now, but um, we're, I'll, I'll show you what we're going to be doing this week. Uh, in the last few weeks, 
and this is going to be some, I'm going to refer to this a lot today. The idea of God's rule became more and more concrete. I don't know about you, but for me, when I thought of God's rule, I think of the laws. And I think of the, the thou shalt and thou shalt not. Shalt not? Thou shalt not. Um, but what we mean by this is, this is the measuring stick. This is, the, this is what God has intended for us to align ourselves with. And it's very much like the benchmarks of, of building a home where you've got to have something to align with. Otherwise, you start going all over the place. Things just get wild. Right? And so we're going to be talking about God's rule, his standard. It's the measuring stick that brings us back into alignment with him. So today, we're going to tackle a, a sneaky one. We're going to be talking, today we're going to be talking about pride. Oh, how did that get in there? Oh my goodness. Well, this is actually this is kind of embarrassing. We're talking about pride and, and here we have a picture of me and yesterday I, I had a, an ace in my tournament, which I also won. Pausing for applause. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, let me tell you about it. So, uh, yeah, yesterday I was in a, so this is disc golf, everybody, and I'm a bit of a disc golf evangelist. I think you should all be playing. It's really fun. It's free. Well, the tournament wasn't free to go into, but I, I get money when I win, so that's good too. So, this is a picture of me after my longest ace ever, Matt, 190 feet. Yes, I was very proud. It's the fastest disc I've ever thrown. That's a, that's a speed four. Just so you know, that's a, my uh, West Side Tursus is what it's called. Anyways, and um, so, yeah, you go to a tournament, and I won for the first time. It's the first time I've ever won a tournament. So I'm very proud, which is really ironic when you think about what we're teaching on today. We are teaching about pride. This is part one of three, and we're going to be looking at the problem of pride. If you want to know... Why, if you, if you want any kind of idea as to why we should take the problem of pride seriously, you really don't need to look a lot farther than the way Jesus looked at pride. If you watch the life of Jesus, and sometimes we can get really caught up, and justifiably so, uh, it's not good to murder, not good to kill each other, and you'd think that Jesus would come down really hard on the murderers. Like, that's a really bad sin. So you think Jesus would make that a real, like, you guys have got to stop killing each other. That's a, this is a bad thing. And if you're a murderer, that's shame on you. And you would think that Jesus would spend a lot of time with the murderers and the thieves and really coming down hard on the liars and the adulterers. But you know who Jesus was the hardest on? Is the people that were puffed up with pride. Jesus was the most direct, the most confrontational with those who thought highly of themselves. And so if we, if we need no other inspiration to, to concern ourselves with this problem of pride, uh, that just, just follow what Jesus did. Follow where Jesus' attention went. All right, the problem of pride uh, is two-faced. And, and this is actually a new idea to me that uh, I kind of encountered in my study. It's, it's this two-faced problem. And I've written up here, and, and both sides are ugly. So uh, that's not ideal. They are both ugly sides. Um, there are parts of pride that are pre pretty obvious. Innately, we also are repulsed by people who are full of pride. It, and, and we're kind of judgy that way, right? Like we... We see somebody on TV, and, and if they think too highly of themselves, we all like automatically kind of, eh, we're not, we're not as big a fan of them. So we, we kind of self-regulate in a way where people who are arrogant, people who are cocky, we kind of want to see them taken down. In fact, Disney leverages this really well. The, the bad guy is Gaston. Right? He's, and he's, he's, he feels really good about himself. And you're just waiting for that point. And the, you know it's coming because it's Disney. That point where Gaston is going to get his comeuppance and he's going to be knocked down off of his pedestal. That he's going to be, he's going to be uh, kind of set straight. Right? So we've got this innate 
problem with pride. We don't like it. It's, it's an ugly look. But there's a broader variety of pride problems than we might realize. And I'm going to tickle at some sore spots today. Thing. And, and speaking of tickling, and the underbelly of each type of pride often masquerades as humility. So we've got this obvious pride, but, but the other side of it, sometimes it looks like humility, but it's really this, it's just a, another obscure version of pride that I want to kind of um, charge you with, or not charge you with, I want to challenge you with today. Let's look at the next slide here. This is the first two types of pride that I want to talk about. And the art here is this whole two-faced thing. That's kind of, I dragged that in there this week. Self-exaltation is pretty obvious. It's pretty self-explanatory. This is, this is pride where you give credit to yourself. Muhammad Ali was one of those guys, he's, he's more lovable today. But uh, I think a lot of people want to slap the pride off his face when he first started telling people how he is the greatest. Right? That's that self-exaltation. That's a very obvious form of pride. Many of you are really hurt that I've um, gone against Muhammad Ali because he's a likable character. But uh, that, that's, that's one example. Then there's self-degradation, which doesn't look like pride unless you look a little deeper. This is a pride that actually tears himself down and, and says, I'm, I'm the worst. Okay, well, let's, let's first look at... Um, Self-exaltation. Matthew 23 has something to say about this. It says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And we see, we see in Proverbs, as pride goes before a fall. We, there's this, actually there's a, a laundry list. As I was studying, I was like, man, this is like memory verse after memory verse after memory verse about pride. It's all over the place. It's thick in Proverbs. The warnings against pride. In fact, part of my studies this week is I'm like, how do I stitch all these ideas of, of how bad pride is? How do I stitch them all together? Because it's just, they're all saying the same thing. Pride is bad. And, and here we see an example. And there's lots of examples of this. If you think, high, if you are on your high horse, if you are full of pride, it's really just an opportunity to be humbled. And, and when you're prideful, and when God comes in and, and tries to correct that, it's a hard fall. Whereas when you're, when you're lowly, and this is going to get confusing in a second, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk you through it. When you are humble, uh, God finds a way of building you up. And so, uh, just as a, as a general rule, it's, it's better to be built up than to be knocked down. Uh, just a confession that I've confessed before. When I first started pastoring, one of the things I was all too aware of, I, in my own kind of thought life and prayer life, is like, I, I knew that being here, uh, let me back up. I became a teacher because I wanted people to look at me. I wanted the attention. How screwed up is that, right? I was the kid in class. When I was a student, I would do anything to get the attention of the entire class. I didn't care how much trouble I got in. It was a win. If I had eyes on me, if I got a giggle, I, that was a total win. And so I think that's what I found attractive about being a teacher. I remember, Judy, you'll remember this. I served in Sharon Douglas's class with uh, uh, a young man named Matt. I was, a, I was working with this one boy in Sharon Douglas's class. And I would watch her teach and be like, this is awesome. She's got everybody's attention. So I wanted to become a teacher. And, and I knew that as I transitioned from teaching into pastoring, that that pride, that, that need for attention was not going to be good for me. It wouldn't be good for our congregation. And so I started praying early that God would humble me. That is the worst prayer to pray. Because he'll do it, and he does a good job of it. He, not, he knocks you down. He's, he loves us, but he will answer that prayer. And, and it's hard being humbled. And it's lovely being exalted when you are humble. This, this should scare us. This idea that when we, are, when we put ourselves up here, that we're going to get knocked down. That should 
elicit a little bit of fear. But let's talk about this self-degradation. Because it, self-degradation can, can look like humility. It can look like, okay, well, I don't think very highly of myself. But when we're putting ourselves down, well, let's read what it says here in Ephesians 2. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When I complain and put myself down for being short and fat, well, the short part's not my fault. But uh, when I put myself down for those things, I'm actually c- complaining or I'm, I'm downgrading God's workmanship. He made me. When we tear ourselves down, we're actually being prideful. You're prideful because you're self-absorbed. Pride, another word for pride is just looking at yourself. Being fixated on yourself, comparing yourself with everything else. And when we are being self-degradating, we are looking at ourselves, we're absorbed with ourselves, and we're comparing ourselves with the rest of the world. You're focusing on yourself. You are preoccupied with yourself. That is pride. And there's times when we're wallowing in our self-degradation. That we, we start to kind of, well, at least I'm humble. That's not humility. That's just a different form of pride. I'm going to wade into some really dangerous waters with, with one comment, and I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Because uh, I'm going to talk about suicide. Suicide, first of all, it's, it's heart-wrenching. And, and when people get to the point where they feel that life is better just not living, that, that's, a, that's a brutal, brutal low. And it's heartbreaking. It, it is, is, is one of the saddest things I can think of. But if I'm going to shoot straight, when we get to that point, that, that's a pride problem. We, we're, we're so fixated on ourselves and on our situation that we don't give thought to the, the wide swath of people that are going to be just brutalized by the loss of you. And, and I know that, that oftentimes the, the suicidal person feels like nobody else cares. They feel like, well, no, this isn't going to affect anybody but me. And that is always a lie. Okay? And I know that's a hard thing anytime you, you, you confront somebody who's suicidal and tell them they're doing something wrong. That's, that's, a, that's a tough one. Uh, but I got to be honest with you. That is a, that is a form of pride. Now, I don't want you to use this as a weapon and go and counsel somebody who is struggling and say, hey, you're really sitting right now. Okay, that's, that's foolish. But we need to understand that that is a form of pride and that it does affect the world around us. If we take time to look beyond ourselves, that is a brutal thing to do to other people. All right, sorry, that's a hard one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving here. Let's look at the next two, self-promotion and self-demotion. Self-promotion is pride that welcomes credit from others. They like to kind of do things very publicly. Um, I always get nervous when somebody says that they they would like to speak. They want to preach. Um, because honestly, this, the, this place is a place that it, you're flirting with pride all the time. Right? Whereas I love to elevate the people who I, I believe have a word from God... And they and they, I like to push people to, into this spot. Pride that welcomes credit from others. Self demotion is pride that compares themselves to others. Self promotion says, "Look what I've done." And this is a super common one that we'll all struggle with at times. Self demotion is that I'm not as good as others. Let's look again at, at self promotion. I'm going to read a couple of slides here. Let's read through Matthew six for a bit says this, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Actually, let me pause there for a second. He's saying, you've, you've got your reward. If you, if you get the, the applause, I love Jessica when she leads worship. Uh, a natural response at our SNL Saturday nights is like any good concert. After a song, people are applauding. They're woohooing. 
And, and Jessica's like, okay, that's fine, but let's make sure that the focus, we're, we're clapping because of what Jesus has done. Let's redirect that praise. And what is being said here in Matthew is that when we do stuff, um, if I were to come in here and sweep the floors and I make sure that I dawdle just enough to be caught by somebody else so they can pat me on the back and say, oh, David, you are such a servant. I have received my reward. That pat in the back, that's as good as it gets. Let's move on. Matthew 6, 2 says this, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their rewards. He's describing a situation I don't know how literal this is. That literally people would come in and have people go before them with trumpets. Bob is about to give his tithe. He is about to save the world through his finances. I don't, I don't know if that's what actually literally happened, but that image of, of taking the big check and handing, and, and I'm not against big checks. In fact, if you'd like to cut one in Northridge, bless you. Um, but it, it's, and sometimes that's, that's a part of kind of promoting what's happening. So let's, let's move along. But when you make a big deal out of your giving, then the people you're making a big deal in front of, that's, that's your audience. That is your reward. And it's remarkably limited compared to what the Father wants to lavish on you when you do it in secret. Like what audience do you care more about? It's hard not to care about what other people think here on earth and in this moment. But if you could see the world and the Father side by side, I guarantee you, you would care a lot more about what God thinks about you. And you become much more motivated to do these things, this, this time of, um, of doing good things and praying and giving. Do that in private. The temptation to get credit for your goodness can be overwhelming, but it's only fueling that pride. Uh, for self-demotion, I've got a quote from John Piper. I, I thought this was quite clever. It goes like this. The reason self-pity or self-demotion does not look like pride is that it appears to be needy. It looks humble. But the need arises from a wounded ego. And the desire of the self-pitying is not really for others to see them as helpless, but as heroes. The, the need self-pity feels did not come from a sense of unworthiness, but from a sense of unrecognized worthiness. It is the response of unapplauded pride. What he's saying here is that that person who is in self-demotion is actually not humble. A humble person will kind of will, will live in that humility. But a person who is self-demoting is kind of putting it out there. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm not as good as other people. I'm not really worthy. But really what he's kind of fishing for is the person saying, No, I saw you sweeping the floor, David. You're worthy. And, and this self-demotion is actually unrecognized. They feel like it's unrecognized worthiness. Does that make sense? Kind of a, a, a bit of an obscure one. But let's look at the next two. These are the final two that we'll look at back to back here. It's the pride of self-justification. This is a dangerous one. This, is a, this should be a scary one. Self-justification and self-condemnation. The first is quite obvious. This is a pride that expects credit from God. They are self-righteous. They think, or they see themselves in a way where they've done enough good. Like, I'm good with God. I've done a lot of good things. My list of good things is much, much bigger than the list of bad things. So that self-justification in their mind, because of how they see themselves, they're good with God. And you know what that's bypassing? They're, that's bypassing the whole need for Jesus, the gospel message we've been talking about for the last seven weeks. When you are self-justified, you become God. You're good enough to be with God. 
And that's a freaky place to be. Self-condemnation is pride that judges yourself. Where you say you're worthless. And both of them are a problem. And we're going to see why. Let's read in Luke 18. We're going to read quite a bit of it right here. Um, and this is, this is a big one. So let's spend some time. It says here. He also told this parable to some who, were, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And treated others with contempt. You'll recognize this parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee. The other, a tax collector. Verse 11 says, The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Verse 13 goes on to say, But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Verse 14 says this, I tell you, this man, the text collector, went down to his house justified. That means right with God rather than the other. For everyone who exalts, you'll recognize this verse. This is the Luke version of what we read in Matthew 23. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, this phrase or this, uh, this verse or part of the verse is, is something that is uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Pretty simple in its idea. And, and the way Jesus tells parables, it, it becomes pretty easy to see the revelation. It's pretty easy to see the point that Je he's the master teacher, the point he's trying to make. Is this Pharisee who's talking himself up, I do all these things really, really well. He's not the one that is right with God. He's not walking according to the rule because pride has taken him off course. Whereas the tax collector, he sees, he's held the mirror up and he sees the sin in his life. And he sees a need for God's saving grace. And his wording is really important. Have mercy on me, a sinner. So the self-justification is something that um, I, I think is just is, is super prevalent and I think part of it is a cultural thing where we measure ourselves against our neighbor, where we, we look at how bad things are in other, uh, in other stories. We, we, we read these brutal stories of, of brutal things that are happening in this world, and we measure ourselves like, yeah, I'm doing all right. Uh, you all can say, yeah, I made it to church on Sunday. I'm doing pretty good. Okay, I could have kept sleeping. But um, we, can, we can find a hundred different ways to self-justify. And actually with all of these things, you're going to find yourselves trending or, or naturally moving to one side or the other where, where you will find different things to feel good about yourself. And, and you, you struggle with the, natu the, the normal kind of side of pride. Where, where you can kind of get puffed up and feel good about yourself easy. But then there's the other side. This self-condemnation. And at first glance, this tax collector can look like he's condemned himself. But I want to show you the difference between self-justification, or excuse me, between self-condemnation and actual humility. Let's look, actually, uh, this is another quote. I, I didn't give credit to anybody because I can't remember who I, where I found this, but it says this. Self-condemnation. The self-condemned person makes himself judge. This is key. He seizes the rightful authority away from God and gives it to himself. The humble man relinquishes all desire to pass judgment on himself. He understands that he stands condemned in God's presence. God has the authority and the power to condemn us. So instead of judgment, the humble man begs for mercy. This is the difference between what the tax collector was doing. This is, this is what humility looks like when you're like, I am a sinner. That's, that's, that's my problem. 
and, and God, I need your mercy. That's humility. Understanding our position amongst the throne or in the presence of the throne. We are under God's perfect uh, presence. We need him. We need his, we need his saving from our brokenness. The one who self-condemns, he acts as judge and jury in his life. Not only is he saying, I am broken, I am sinful, but he pronounces judgment on himself. He, he says, because of that, I can't, I'm unworthy. I am, I'm, I am useless. There's nothing left for me. And they stay in that place of self-condemnation. They judge themselves. And they sentence themselves to a... Um, A verdict as a result of their sinfulness, as a result of their brokenness. And that is pride. That's not your job. You are not called to be judge of yourself. You are called to measure yourself according to the rule. And what you're inevitably going to find is that you're off course. That you're imperfect. You're not perfect with God. You are off course in some way. And the, the, the humble response is crying out to God, God, have mercy on me. Please bring me back into proper alignment with you. Here's the last slide. Well, actually, it's not the last slide. One of the last slides. Humility is the antidote to pride. Um, I'm going to read from Matthew 18. I marked it here. Beginning in verse 23. And this is a story that you'll probably recognize. It goes like this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. His servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, this could almost read him, but when that jerk went out, he he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a pittance compared to the massive debt that he owed. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Well, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. The master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the, from the heart. This is a, a, a parable told for a different purpose. But I, I, want, I wanted to share it this morning. Because we have all been forgiven for so much. Actually, I want to invite the worship team up um, just in the background. And we're going to do something before we actually respond to worship. But we have all been forgiven for so much. If you don't understand that part of the equation, if, if you think you're doing pretty well, well, we could probably refer back to um, self-justification. Uh, and that, that could be a problem you're going to want to look at. But if you've got, arrived at that point where you realize, okay, yeah, no, I am flawed. I am sinful. I am not perfect. Do you know what we deserve? And deserve is a word that furrows my brow. It's, it, the more I get into the word, the more I get repulsed by this, this idea that we deserve stuff. I worked hard this week. I deserve a break this weekend. I deserve a higher pay or a higher wage. I deserve to come home to a house that's clean and, and uh, food on the table. I deserve this and that and the other thing. When we, when we understand what we've been forgiven from, that idea of feeling like we deserve stuff 
really starts to evaporate. And our humility and our gratitude for what we've been delivered from, for what we've been saved from, starts to come into focus. And that is what humility is. Humility is not just feeling bad about yourself. That's actually pride. Humility is valuing what God does for us because he loves us. Uh, again, before we respond in worship, I, I want to invite you into some time of uh, a prayer. I, and I want to give some time. This is, is not something where I encourage you to get up and get a coffee. Don't encourage you to go to the bathroom. We're almost done. I, I want you to do something. And I've, and I've got some specific instructions for this. I feel like uh, I've, I've got some weird guidelines for you. I want you to spend some time considering how you're doing when it comes to pride. Maybe, maybe think about which of these you might identify most with. And you know what? Some of us are doing pretty well when it comes to humility. So this might not be something that defines you. But pride is one of those things that just creeps in. And, and, and it's probably tickling you somewhere. And so I want to create a space right now. Um, in fact, I see... Some, cu some couples cuddling out there, and I love it. I, I want you to put, keep your arms to yourself for a second. Sorry. I, I, this, is, this is something between you and God. And in fact, this is the other weird instruction I have for you today. Somebody might, in this room, somebody might be really affected by this, might feel real conviction about this. And they might become emotional. I don't know. This might be something that really triggers you. And normally, I would, I would celebrate... You're kind of putting your hand on them, consoling them. I don't want you to do that today. Today, I want you to stay in your own space. Keep your hands to yourself. Stay in your own space. And I want you to spend some time with God. This is just you and God. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to bow your heads. I don't want you to look around at anything else around you. And I'm going to get quiet. We're going to have Alex, maybe Jen, play in the background. And we're going to spend some time and we're going to come before God. And I want this to be an opportunity for repentance. The last thing I want to say before we actually enter into this time of prayer. Is repentance isn't just wallowing in our sin. Repentance is acknowledging that there's something off. And that we need the mercy of the Father in our lives. And that's what this time is dedicated to. So we're going to spend some time in prayer. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up in prayer before uh, we respond in worship. And then I'll have something else to say. Uh, but let me start prayer as well. Father, I pray that this time would become sacred. Father, take us out of this moment, this physical space. And I pray, Father, that we would come into your presence. And as we taught last week, if, if that's not an intimidating, reverent moment, I don't know what is. In fact, if that's not an intimidating, reverent moment, then, then that's probably a first indication of pride. If we feel in any way worthy to be in your presence, we're, we're way off base. But Father, we come before you, and right now, each of us comes individually before you. And Father, we want to take the burden off our back. We want to take out of our backpack and lay at your feet our problems of pride. Whether they be the, the obvious problems where we feel too strongly or too good about ourselves or the other kinds of pride where we have uh, put ourselves down and we're carrying burdens of, of self-examination, of self-absorption that we should not be carrying. Holy Spirit, we invite you to minister to us right now and reveal. Sometimes we can't get to this place in our own mind. Sometimes we need the Holy Spirit to, to point out those things in us. And Father, as the lights begin to turn on in our hearts and in our minds, I pray that with it you would send your principi your, your peace that just transcends all understanding and that even though we are confronted with our sinfulness, we would feel peace because we're in your presence. Let's pray together. Or let's pray alone together.
I feel like my role as pastor is to is to nudge you out of that point of self-condemnation where you just you identify the brokenness, you identify where you're off. I feel like my role right now in this moment is to nudge you back to crying out for mercy. And crying out for mercy sounds like we're, we're hoping for mercy. But that's not the way it works. When we cry out for mercy, it's instant. God is quick to forgive. He wants to bring you back into alignment, to, to bring him back into uh, being justified under him. So his answer is yes and amen. So church, if you haven't done that yet in your moment of contemplation and prayer between you and the Father, if you haven't moved from that point of brokenness to the point of feeling and receiving his free gift of mercy, I just want to encourage you to do that right now. Okay, we're going to do one more thing. Actually, it might be three more things. The first thing is I, I want... Um, I'm going to ask the worship team to actually play through this song um, once, and I want you to remain seated. And you might continue doing the same thing. You might continue to pray, or you might just meditate on the words being sung. And then Alex is going to invite us to join in at um, a part in the song. And that's when I'm going to invite you to stand, and we'll sing out, and we'll respond in worship. And then after that, I've got, I've got one more thing I want to share with you. So let's, let's receive the words of this song together.